So let's talk a little bit about the distribution of interstitial lung diseases. And the reason that's so important is that when we think about patients and how to classify them, it's important to recognize that their age is a big factor. IPF is a disease of an aging community, and we know it's three times more likely in an 80-year-old than it is in a 50-year-old. That's in contrast to the connective tissue diseases, which tend to afflict a younger grouping, and frankly, tends to be more female than male, unlike IPF, which is more male than female. And so what we can see is that we can see how that aggregates in these patients uh, overall. The last example would be sarcoid, which again presents in patients who tend to be a little bit younger. And the reason is that they tend to burn out. So that by the time you see a 65-year-old sarcoid patient, it tends to be a much smaller grouping of those patients as they've had a chance to frankly um, correct themselves uh, naturally over time. So as we talk about IPF in specific, while there are common overlapping uh, presentations, there are elements that in, in constellation really help point to it. Certainly shortness of breath is a very generic symptom. But when you couple that to a non-productive cough and the Velcro crackles that are common in these patients, I would argue the Velcro crackles are in 100%. Digital clubbing tends to be in somewhere between 25 and 33%. Fatigue, of course, is incredibly generic. And exercise desaturation will be seen depending on the level of severity. Things that should lead you in other directions are things like wheezing. While we may see some cyanosis, it's not a common presentation because that level of oxygen desaturation at a resting level is very uncommon. We can, we can see right heart failure in these patients, but often very late in the disease. So it's not going to be a common presenting element either. And if we see things like fever, that should really make you think of another disease process. Now, weight loss and cachexia is something we're picking up more and more as these patients live longer and longer, because this was a grouping uh, and an element of that cachexia that doesn't happen until very late, and it's required that patients begin to survive before we see it. And of course, if you see arthritis or other elements of a connective tissue disorder, really you're talking about overlap or the interstitial pneumonitis with autoimmune featured category. Now, the sine qua non of this disease, without a doubt, is the CT scan that shows you that honeycomb pattern. But it's important to recognize that honeycomb pattern is only there about two thirds of the time, maybe a little less than that. But it's important to recognize because it is definitive for that usual interstitial pneumonia pattern. And we see exactly what the name describes. Cystic changes in the peripheral basal posterior elements of the lung that appear like a beehive's honeycomb. And when you see that, if you biopsy that, it will be a usual interstitial pneumonia pattern on the glass slide reviewed by the pathologist. My favorite view of this is actually on the sagittal coronal sections, as opposed to the axials. And the reason for that is you can really pick up that posterior basal presentation mixed in with the bronchiectasis, right? The bronchiectasis is often difficult to separate on the axials because you're cutting the tubes on end. Whereas on this coronal section, we really get this beautiful kind of sensation of the honeycomb down at the bottom. Okay, what are the histopathologic features that we see in a usual interstitial pneumonia pattern? The key feature is really microscopic honeycombing, much like we see on the CT scan, coupled to architectural distortion. We have presentation of patchy involvement of the lung. We see, should see normal lung juxtaposed to abnormal lung. Fibroblastic foci have got to be there, right? That's one of the key elements. And then because we are still a diagnosis of exclusion, the absence of features against an alternative diagnosis. We will often see elements of other processes, organizing pneumonia, the occasional granuloma. It's really about that overall impression. It's not looking for purity, it's looking for the overall sense of what that biopsy is representing in the lung as a whole. Well, as we try to figure out how our patient is going to do, there are certain elements that really help. The dynamic integration of the six minute walk, which really tells you how bad the VQ mismatch is going to be when the patient exerts themselves, is incredibly predictive of their mortality in the subsequent period 
if they've shown signs of desaturation, that's a marker as a poor outcome. Pulmonary function testing in general helps designate these patients as mild, moderate, and severe. But that turns out to be a tough thing to use. And the reason is while we love to do that as human beings and put them into those categories, it doesn't tell us the rate. And so there's little doubt that a patient with a very re severely reduced FEC is probably not gonna do well. But the real question is how long did it take them to get there? It's the same story with the DLCO and the TLC. And it's important to recognize that if you had concomitant emphysema, that that's gonna also reduce the DLCO. And you wanna know how much of that DLCO is being reduced from the pulmonary fibrosis versus the emphysema. So we know that these low level baseline predictors all associate with poor outcomes. But when we move to dynamic predictors, dynamic predictors are really much stronger at predicting outcomes. Why? Because they reflect change over time. And so when you look at the decline in the FEC over a six month or 12 month period, it's a terrific predictor of mortality. And this shouldn't surprise. And there are numerous publications that really support this. What's a terrible predictor of is subsequent FBC decline. And isn't that fascinating, right? It doesn't help you separate out what the next behavior is gonna be. And some of that really speaks to the heterogeneity of the behavior of the disease. The same is true of the DLCO. The DLCO, likewise, the dynamic decline in the DLCO really helps organize uh, and predict what the behavior of the patient's gonna be. If there's a decline in the DLCO over a six or 12 month period, it's highly predictive of how the patient's gonna behave. The last kind of interesting element that's had a growing body of evidence would be the bronchoalveolar lavage findings. And really that's got two aspects to it. Um, the first is really recognizing that as a diagnosis of exclusion, it can show us things that can help us and classify the type of patient that we have uh, from an interstitial lung disease standpoint. And that, of course, is gonna correlate back to their prognosis. So we can certainly discern whether or not there's diffuse alveolar hemorrhage, if there's a PI syndrome, if there's sarcoidosis, based on their CD4, CD8 balances, things of that nature can certainly come into play. And lastly, pulmonary artery pressure. Well, it turns out that's really a sign and a reflection of that DLCO and a sign, if you will, of the level of severity of what's going on. When the pulmonary artery pressure starts to rise, that's a bad prognostic marker because you really started to show that there are signs of right heart failure and core pulmonary. 